well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you're with me on the program today. All right, well, we did get a Supreme Court decision this morning. We didn't get Rahimi, nor did we get uh, Garland versus Cargill, but we did get a decision in NRA versus Vulo. Now, this is not technically a Second Amendment case. It's actually a First Amendment case. Uh, Maria Vulo was a New York official who uh, instructed insurance companies, uh, listen, you know, if you don't stop doing business with the NRA and other uh, gun groups, ah, I mean, you're opening yourself up to all kinds of uh, scrutiny from my office. And maybe it'd be best if you just stayed away from those groups altogether. Uh, the NRA sued Maria Vulo, alleging that uh, that action infringed on their First Amendment right and a unanimous decision. By the Supreme Court today, 9-0, the Supreme Court agreed that the NRA had plausibly raised First Amendment claims, uh, despite what the Second Circuit Court of Appeals had previously said in dismissing those claims, and they remanded the case back to the Second Circuit for further review. Uh, this is a good decision. Now, there is, I will say, there's a loophole in there for uh, Maria Vulo and other bureaucrats who might try to, uh, you know, chill the uh, protected activities of groups like the NRA. But we'll get to that uh, as we go through this uh, case. So let's talk about this. So first, of all, here's the holding. The NRA plausibly alleged that the respondent violated the First Amendment by coercing regulated entities to terminate their business relationships with the NRA in order to punish or suppress gun promotion advocacy. Now, the court didn't say that the NRA has proved this claim. Right. But they said this is plausible enough that the Second Circuit should have considered this rather than simply dismissing that claim outright. Writing for the unanimous uh, court, Justice Sonia Sotomayor uh, said that to state a claim that the government violated the First Amendment through coercion of a third party, a plaintiff must plausibly allege conduct that viewed in context could be reasonably understood to convey a threat of adverse government action in order to punish or suppress speech. Here, the NRA plausibly alleged that Vulo violated the First Amendment by coercing Department of Financial Services regulated entities into disassociating with the NRA in order to punish or suppress gun owner or gun promotion advocacy. Uh, Vulo had argued a couple of things, uh, including the uh, idea that, well, I mean, as you find in favor of the NRA here. You're going to be chilling my First Amendment rights. You're going to be uh, subjecting bureaucrats to all kinds of uh, handcuffs that they shouldn't be entitled to that are going to prevent them from doing their job. Again, the unanimous opinion of the Supreme Court, Vulo's arguments to the contrary lack merit. The conceded illegal, uh, illegality of the NRA-endorsed insurance programs, like Carry Guard, does not insulate Vulo from First Amendment scrutiny under Bantam Books, nor does her argument that her actions targeted non-expressive business relationships Change the fact that the NRA alleges her actions were aimed at punishing or suppressing speech. In other words, Vula says, I mean, look, I was, you know, telling these businesses not to do business with the NRA, but that wasn't telling the NRA what to say or do. NRA, on the other hand, said, no, 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 that is absolutely having a chilling effect, because if we change our conduct, then maybe you won't find these relationships to be so unacceptable. It's because of our advocacy that you are telling these companies not to do business with us, right? The court went on to say that uh, Vulo claims that the NRA's position, if accepted, would stifle government speech and hamper legitimate enforcement efforts. But the con court's conclusion simply reaffirms the general principle that where, as here, the complaint plausibly alleges coercive threats aimed at punishing or suppressing disfavored speech, the plaintiff states a First Amendment claim. The opinion goes on to say that the NRA's allegations, if true, highlight the constitutional concerns with the kind of strategy that Vulo purportedly adopted. Although the NRA was not the directly regulated party here, Vulo allegedly used the power of her office to target gun promotion by going after the NRA's business partners. Nothing in this case immunizes the NRA from regulation, nor prevents government officials from condemning disfavored views. The takeaway is that the First Amendment prohibits government officials from wielding their power selectively to punish or suppress speech directly, or as alleged here, through private intermediaries. Now, I, I will say there, there is a quibble here that uh, Justice Sotomayor constantly refers to gun promotion. That's not what the NRA is about. The NRA is about protecting the right to keep and bear arms. 
That's what Maria Vulo found so contemptible. That's why Maria Vulo told these companies, don't do business with the NRA. Not because they were promoting guns, because they were promoting our right to keep and bear arms. Um, Sotomayor also said, as discussed below, Vula was free to criticize the NRA and pursue the conceded violations of New York insurance law, but she could not wield her power to threaten enforcement actions against Department of Financial Services regulated entities in order to punish or suppress the NRA's gun promotion advocacy. Again, because the complaint plausibly alleges that Vulo did just that, the court holds that the NRA did plausibly state a First Amendment violation. Uh, also from the opinion, as alleged, uh, Sotomayor writes, Vulo's communications with Lloyds of London can be reasonably understood as a threat or as an inducement. Either of these can be coercive. As Vulo concedes, the threat need not be explicit. And as the Solicitor General explains, the Constitution does not distinguish between comply or I'll prosecute and comply and I'll look the other way. So whether analyzed as a threat or as an inducement, the conclusion is the same. Vulo allegedly coerced Lloyds by saying that she would ignore unrelated infractions and focus her enforcement efforts on NRA-related businesses alone if Lloyds seized underwriting NRA policies and disassociated from gun promotion groups. Yeah. You know, I mean, again, the actions here are despicable. Uh, Maria Vulo, as the NRA alleges, uh, did not like the advocacy that the NRA did. Uh, neither did uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo. In fact, um, I, I will I will put this up on the screen. You might have a hard time following along because this is a uh, lengthy bit of text. But uh, this also comes from the uh, unanimous opinion today. Uh, just like in her meeting with Lloyd's executives, Vulo singled out the NRA and other gun promotion organizations as the target of her call to action more broadly for insurance companies. This time, the guidance letters that were released by her office reminded DFS, uh, DFS regulated businesses or regulated entities of their obligation to consider their, quote, reputational risks and then tie that obligation to an encouragement for, quote, prompt action to manage these risks. Evocative of Vulo's private conversation with the Lloyd's executives a few weeks earlier, the press release revealed how to manage the risks by encouraging DFS regulated entities to, quote, discontinue their arrangements with the NRA, just like Chubb did when it stopped underwriting Carry Guard. A follow on tweet from then Governor Cuomo reaffirmed the message businesses in New York should, quote, consider their reputations and revisit any ties they have to the NRA which he called a, quote, extremist organization. In sum, the court says, the complaint assessed as a whole plausibly alleges that Vulo threatened to wield her power against those refusing to aid her campaign to punish the NRA's gun promotion advocacy. If true, that violates the First Amendment. Now, what's the uh, wrinkle in this case? <laughs> well, there's a little tiny footnote at the end of uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor's opinion that says the Second Circuit is free to consider uh, an immunity claim on the part of Maria Vulo. So they vacated the Second Circuit decision. They remanded the case back to the Second Circuit for further review in light of their findings in today. But they also told the Second Circuit, hey, you know what? Uh, here's another out, <laughs> right? If uh, if you want to let Maria Vulo off the hook, you can always, you know, pursue this uh, idea that, well, she's immune from litigation because she took this action in her official capacity as head of the Department of Financial Services, which I, 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 to me, this opens up a whole can of worms, right? I mean, the Supreme Court just said that the government and government officials cannot wield their power. Uh, in a way uh, that is designed to suppress the First Amendment rights of affected groups. And then the court said, unless, of course, you want to make the case that they're doing so in their official capacity. So I, I, that, that, to me, is a, it's a very small footnote that could make a very big impact on this case going forward. Uh, this is obviously not the end of the story, right? So the Supreme Court remanded this case back down to the Second Circuit. The Second Circuit could actually send this case all the way back down to the trial court for further review. 
uh, which, of course, would add to the delays and the legal expenses of the NRA as they continue pursuing uh, litigation against Maria Vulo. Uh, we'll see what the NRA does. I, I suspect that they will keep this lawsuit alive uh, for now, at least. Uh, what the Second Circuit does remains to be seen, but I also have a sneaking suspicion that they're going to take that suggestion from the court that uh, they consider uh, the possibility that uh, Maria Vulo is immune from litigation because she was uh, you know, acting in her official capacity. Uh, and so this case may very well be going back to the Supreme Court at some point uh, if, in fact, the Second Circuit does take that bait and uh, uh, absolves Maria Vulo from any sort of litigation, even though she uh, plausibly was suppressing the First Amendment rights of the uh, NRA and its members. So we are still uh, awaiting again action in both the Rahimi case and Garland versus Cargill. There are, I believe, 31 decisions that are still uh, outstanding. So next week and the uh, coming weeks could be busy. Uh, typically, the court tries to wrap things up you know, fairly early in June, but I, I guess the schedule this year uh, has them releasing opinions uh, through at least mid-June. So it could be a couple of more weeks before we learn anything about uh, either Rahimi or Cargill. But this was a, a very good decision. Now, listen, you're not going to get a 9 nothing decision from the court when it comes to a case specifically dealing with the right to keep and bear arms. <laughs> this is about as close as you'll find a 9 nothing decision in favor of a group that supports the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, but even with this slight footnote right, that could pose problems uh, down the road. I do think that this was a good decision. It was certainly the right decision to make. Um, I would have preferred had they not instructed the Second Circuit that, uh, you know, there is still another avenue available to you if you want to dismiss these claims. Uh, but that might have been tacked on there in order to get that uh, unanimous decision. Either way, um, uh, you know, the record is pretty clear now that you had this official in New York, and not just one official, by the way. I mean, Letitia James's war on the NRA didn't come up in this case, but that was a part of this too. Um, the court mentioned this uh, tweet from then-Governor Andrew Cuomo, but uh, Governor Cuomo was, again, certainly among those uh, attacking the NRA's existence, the NRA's right to exist. And all of this is on the record. All of this is now a part of written history. As a part of the, uh, the, the, the court's, you know, uh, jurisprudence that, yes, government officials do appear to at least plausibly, you can make that plausible argument, that New York officials were abusing their position of authority to go after groups who, uh, whose very existence is about protecting and defending a fundamental civil right. Not gun promotion, as uh, Sonia Sotomayor wrote, but the right to keep and bear arms. So, uh, congratulations to the NRA. Ha ha to Maria Vulo. And uh, I guess we'll now see what the Second Circuit does going forward. All right, before we get to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day and our recidivist report, let's talk about this for just a second. We were talking about the First Amendment. And you know, at the very heart of our democracy lies a principle that we hold sacred, free speech. Is the cornerstone that supports every freedom we cherish. Yet in today's digital age, discussions about our wealth, our rights, and our future are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives, leaving many folks feeling voiceless in conversations that are crucial to our financial independence and security. This is where wealth protection research steps in, armed with a mission that's never been more critical. Wealth protection research is not a financial advisory firm. They're defenders of free speech, committed to giving a voice to the silenced. Wealth Protection Research tirelessly seeks out financial experts, the voices that challenge prevailing narratives, especially as we navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. Wealth Protection Research has created a 2024 election wealth protection report. Now, this free report highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas the mainstream media won't touch. And listeners can get it completely free. Just text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. If you believe in the sanctity of free speech and the importance of financial freedom, then act now. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy of this 2024 election protection report. It's time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas the establishment doesn't think you can handle, and to take control of our financial destinies. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. All right, let's turn our attention now to today's Armed Citizen story. 
our good deed of the day and our recidivist report, uh, which features a, a man from Florida who has a bit of a problem, apparently, keeping his junk in his pants. Man on probation for exposing himself, arrested for a similar crime. Yeah, this was in uh, Clearwater, Florida. And it uh, dates back to February. February 24th of uh, this year, a woman was walking to her car in the uh, shopping mall parking lot. She saw a man sitting in the driver's seat of a uh, vehicle there. She said the man was fondling himself, made direct eye contact with her. She called 911, but by the time police arrived, he was gone. Two days later, she saw the same man in the same parking lot. Police uh, did some investigating. They identified 24-year-old Jonte Lynn as the suspect. And it was discovered that Mr. Lynn has previously been convicted uh, uh, twice, actually, of two counts of exposure of sexual organs, once in 2022 once in 2023, and both times, apparently, Lynn was placed on probation for this offense, even after a second time of exposing himself in public. Nothing more than a slap on the uh, <clears throat> wrist, I suppose, and uh, and he was on his way. May 29th, Lynn arrested again, charged now with one kind of exposure of sexual organs as well as one count of violation of probation. When detectives interviewed Lynn, they said that he was cooperative. He acknowledged that he has impulses he can't control, <clears throat> which that does suck. I suggest you get help for that. Maybe you can find some help for that when you're behind bars because your compulsive behavior does not negate the fact that people should be able to walk through a parking lot uh, without having to see somebody, you know, pleasuring themselves in a uh, vehicle there. So we'll see if the third time is the charm for John uh, Jonte Lynn, but I uh, have to say I, I expect that uh, he's probably going to receive on a third strike more probation for this offense. Today's Armed Citizen story, Reno, Nevada, where police say a man was killed in a self-defense shooting. This was um, Wednesday afternoon. Reno police got a call just before 3 p.m. on a report of uh, two men who had gotten into an argument where shots were fired. Police arrived and found both of the individuals still there, one of them suffering from a gunshot wound. He was taken to a local hospital where he passed away. The uh, second person who was involved, <clears throat> excuse me, reportedly uh, stayed on scene, fully cooperated with investigation. Uh, with the investigation. You know, police department uh, said after speaking with that uh, individual that the shooting was a justified act of self-defense. Um, now, nobody has been identified. Please haven't really detailed the circumstances of this, but uh, the evidence must have been pretty clear if they made that determination uh, within a matter of minutes or hours of this uh, shooting being reported. So we'll see if we can find more information for you in the days to come. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to uh, to get more details for you. Finally today, <clears throat> in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. You know, small town newspapers are just a different breed. I actually, I, I ran across a police blotter from a, a small town in New Mexico yesterday, and I thought about writing up uh, some of the, uh, the the incidents for bearing arms because it's just, it's so different from what we see on the national news, from what we see on the nightly news. It, you know, it, it, things are just, they're just, just a slower pace. Sometimes you really got to struggle to find something to write about. Maybe this was a case in Boaz, Alabama, where a uh, police officer hailed for helping to save flags that had blown over in the wind yeah. I mean, listen, it's not exactly, you know, a uh, earth shattering story, but it's still good to see. Apparently, there was a uh, storm Monday afternoon that blew through Boaz, Alabama, and uh, some flags got knocked over at the Albertville Industrial Park. Uh, Philip Lamaster uh, was out and about, and he uh, saw uh, this uh, police officer, Joseph Estes, uh, picking up the flags. Uh, LeMaster says um, there were numerous American flags blown to the ground, but he said uh, he took the time to stop, stand all the flags back up, secured them upright, and uh, added, Joseph Estes, you are a true American and an amazing police officer. Thank you for your service. Well, let's hope the media doesn't get a hold of this. They are on a tear about flags, and so I'm sure that uh, the officer showing respect for this flag is indication of you know, some type of nefarious behavior there in uh, Boaz, Alabama. I mean, it's Alabama, for God's sake. So uh, hopefully the Washington Post will ignore this story, New York Times, and uh, we'll keep it to the uh, local paper there in Boaz, the uh, Sand Mountain Reporter. 
<laughs> and again, uh, Officer Joseph Estes in the right place at the right time. Wasn't able to do the right thing to help old glory fly straight and true in the uh, breeze. We thank you for your very good deed. All right. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program as always. So the next time that we will see, well, uh, we've got, uh, I guess, a couple of things coming up before the court um, next week. The uh, next time that we will get uh, orders from uh, conference is going to be next Monday, June the 3rd. Remember, we still have the Illinois gun ban cases that the court has held on to. We don't know what's going on with that, but uh, we could see some action on Monday. Um, and as for opinions, uh, again, you know, typically those are released on Thursday, but th there's no rhyme or reason the court uh, can issue them um, any other day of the week. As I said, we've got more than 30 opinions outstanding from this term. The uh, last conference for the court uh, is scheduled for June 20th. So presumably they would like to have everything wrapped up by June 21st uh, and they can go on their summer recess. So we have basically got three weeks left uh, where the court can release Rahimi and Cargill along with the other cases that, uh, you know, we don't really care about as Second Amendment folks. I mean, maybe you do, but uh, we're not going to cover them at buried arms. I suspect that um, Rahimi and Cargill are both going to be some of the last cases that are decided this term. But again, there's no rhyme or reason to this. We don't know. Um, I think Rahimi's actually, there are only two cases, I think, left that were argued in uh, November, and Rahimi is one of them. So, you know, theoretically, if the court has already gone through all of its October arguments and now it's kind of waiting through November, we could expect Rahimi to come out earlier rather than towards the end of the month. But the court also tends to save its more controversial decisions until the end of the term, I think Rahimi, either way, is going to be pretty controversial. I think the same is true for Cargo versus Garland. So, you know, my, my semi-informed speculation is that uh, we don't know when these cases are coming at some point in the next three weeks. I do feel pretty confident about that. But we will be keeping our eyes on the court on Monday when these orders come out. We'll see what, if anything, the court does with the Illinois Gun and Magazine ban cases. I I wrote a VIP piece about this at Bearing Arms earlier this week. I suspect, you know, there are a lot of folks who say, well, maybe the court's going to hold on to this until Rahimi. And Rahimi might uh, guide the uh, Seventh Circuit going forward. I actually think maybe the bump stock ban, uh, Carlin, uh, Garland versus Cargill, uh, would have more of an implication in the Seventh Circuit because the Seventh Circuit has said, well, Illinois' gun ban is presumably fine. Uh, we're not going to grant an injunction because uh, we think that uh, AR-15s and other semi-automatic firearms that are designated as so-called assault weapons aren't protected by the Second Amendment because they're like machine guns. So it seems to me that if the court is hanging on to these Illinois cases um, because one or more decisions that are coming out this term could have an impact on those cases, I mean, maybe Rahimi, which deals with prohibited persons, maybe that's going to have you know some direction for the Seventh Circuit in terms of the text, history, and tradition test that the court has spelled out. But I think it's at least equally plausible that the court is going to use a bump stock ban case to say, hey, you can't treat semi-automatic firearms as machine guns. Fingers crossed. That's my hope anyway. But uh, again, we'll have more for you on Monday's Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. Until then, don't forget to check out the website, bearingarms.com, throughout the uh, remainder of the weekend. We're keeping you up to date on all of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. And if you like what you see, I would encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member as well. Just use the promo code SAVEAMERICA, and you can get 50% off of your VIP or VIP Gold membership. I would recommend the VIP Gold membership. You'll get uh, exclusive stories across the town hall. Uh, media family of websites, you know, PJ Media, Red State, Town Hall, obviously, Twitchy, Hot Air. You'll get uh, the ability to comment on stories across all of the platforms. You'll have an ad-free experience. And you'll still be supporting the independent pro segment of journalism that we're doing here at Bearing Arms. So check it out, bearingarms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code SAVEAMERICA. And thank you again for your support. We'll see you back here soon. Until then, be well. Be safe. And be free.